The Culture Pop Podcast is brought to you by the law offices of Jacob and Ronnie. Accident or injury, call Jacob and Ronnie. Call Jacob. Hey, it's Mace. If you or a friend or loved one is injured in an accident, the first person you should call is my friend Jacob. When I did this, Jacob was great. He helped me by talking through the next steps, which really put my mind at ease. When you're injured in an accident, you got to have an expert. That's why you call Jacob, just like I did. Call Jacob, 844-24 Jacob. That's 844-24 Jacob. Or visit calljacob.com. Call Jacob. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Culture Pop Podcast. I'm Steve Mason, along with Sue Kalinske. Great show today. Uh, by the way, Culture Pop Podcast is where we talk to great guests and talk about everything that's happening in pop culture. Simon Baker, you know him from the long-running CBS hit The Mentalist. He's going to be here to talk about his new gritty movie, Limbo. Sue Kalinske, I'm excited to hear. And then I've got something myself on the fitness front. But tell me, tell me about your training for this triathlon that you've got coming up. Well, as I've said, it's very, very challenging. The guy who has put together this training program, I think he thinks everybody is like like an Iron Man, you know? Because okay. it's really, really intense. It's not like just go out and ride your bike. It's ride your bike for like, you know, 30 seconds, really, really fast. It gives you the RPM that you're supposed to have. I don't have a watch that has any of that, you know? You don't have a watch that tells you RPM? I do not. Well, you, I can get a triathlon watch, but I don't have one. I just have a running watch. Yeah. So it doesn't. So for running, I could, I can do the conditioning more cater to what he's asking us to do. But when it comes to biking and swimming, I just, I just swim. Um, right. I, right. I, I, I mean, the fact that I actually am able to swim the distance is good enough for me you know i'm yeah. not i'm not like i i don't have the ego like i have to win there's no way in the world i'm gonna win this I'm right, not gonna, right i'm not coming in first i'm gonna be in the back i don't care i just want to finish hey of course that's all i mean that's a huge accomplishment just to finish yeah and but the thing is is that i i don't swim all the time right i, I don't i don't even know the last time i actually swam laps and this so, is open water swimming open water but i do go to a pool too so um but it's it's better to go to the open water because that's where the race is going to be so i really want to get acclimated and it gets better every time it's just that i always thought that i you know did freestyle fine but i've been doing it wrong all these years so yeah. i'm using muscles that i'm not used to uh, using and yeah. so it's that the cycling um i started playing pickleball Oh my and, god! And I and and I'm and I'm and I'm golfing again. So there's just my body is like whoa. It's like too much stimulation. Wow, you're out there killing it. I am. This is what happens when you're unemployed. Okay, so Sue, um, my uh, my weight has ticked back up. Really? I don't, I don't notice. Well, it's because you only see me from here up. Well, um, I could see it in your face, maybe. You yeah. Know. Uh, no, I'm at, uh, I, this morning I got on the scale, I was at 197. I'm like, holy shit, what has happened so it, here? Ha have you introduced donuts back into the-, the No, but as you saw yesterday, we're filming this or we're shooting this on Friday, March the 22nd. I was in a pie eating contest face down in a pie. I'm sure that did not help. The stuff I do for this radio station I work for is just ridiculous, is it not? No. Well they pay you the yeah. big bucks. There you go. There you go. So I've got this idea. I've got a buddy of mine named Steve Zim. He runs a uh, gym. I've talked to him about him before. Uh, runs a gym uh, called A Tighter You. Okay. Now he has trained a bunch of people for like movies and TV. Like he trained Christian Bale for The Dark Knight and the Batman movies. Uh, there's a movie out right now called Love Lies Bleeding with Kristen Stewart about her and a, a, yeah. a, an actress who plays a bodybuilder. He trained her, the bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is what I'm thinking about. Tell me if I should do it. I want him to do, and I've seen him do this with other people, a transformation project with me where day one we take pictures, mm -hmm. then I go work out, and then every week we take a picture and we do it for about six months, and then I'm ready for Avengers 10. 
What do you think? <laughs> I think it's a great idea. I think they'll be up to 10 by the time I actually am in shape. You think I should try it? I think just to get a trainer who can transform your body is worth everything. Whether you get a part in a movie, I mean, that's like ridiculous. But um... <laughs> <laughs> that's like ridiculous. But no, I, I mean, want to get I want to get really like yo. You want you want, wanna, you want to get you want to get like buffed. I want you just buff. or you want to get like toned and you want to lose body fat. No, I want to be buff. I want to be out at the the beach and have everybody say, "Who's Zach? That guy must be playing a superhero in a movie." Oh man, don't kick sand in his face. Exactly, exactly. I'm thinking about doing. It. The question is, everybody I know who knows me, I guess that goes without saying. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Everybody who knows who knows me uh, says there's no way I'll stick to it. You won't. Come on. Do I have nobody with faith in me at all, anywhere? Well, you've given us reason to to feel this way. I Wait a minute. I've gone from 217 to, well, now 197 in, in, a, in a year. I mean, I was able to cut 20 pounds plus in a year. You know, when you go out on this venture to change your physique, it's a lifestyle choice. Yes, now, it is. If you, as, and if you don't say this is the way it's going to be, and it's not to say that you can't cheat every now and then, yeah. but you you have to stick to it. You have to change. You have to do a 180, and you have mm. to stick to it. Like so I, I, I have a brother who who's, tends to be overweight, right? Okay. And I remember years ago, he would say to me, you know, you know, I'm, I'm on the bike all the time and, and I'm eating salads and, you know, I'm just not losing weight. And I said, well, what are you putting in the salad? You know, it's like you put in cookies in the salad. Yeah, right, I mean, right. You know, you're not, you know, you can't just do this casually and expect, you know, results. So then he ended up losing weight. You know, nice. he wasn't he wasn't eating late at night. He wasn't drinking as much wine or whatever. And he started to see that, wow, look, I'm thinner now. Oh, I could guess I can go back and like have, you know, cake and, and ice cream at yeah, 10 yeah. o'clock at night. So that's the thing. You know, you have to stop that cycle. See, like, the eating is less hard for me. I can, like I can I can clean up my eating. It's mm -hmm. can I drag my ass to the gym five times a week? That's really the issue. Yeah, um, that's, that's a tough one. That's, that's a, a tough, tough one. one. It's a tough one, yeah, but I'm yeah. thinking about it. I'm not fully, I'm not pot committed. I, I This is a hard maybe. Um, it's a soft yes and a hard maybe. It's not a soft maybe. A soft maybe means, hard maybe means yes, there's absolutely a chance. Now, what does Juan say about this? Does he think that you, you can do this? He scoffs at me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't well, I, you know, it. like, cause Tom, Tom, Tom is the same way, you know? Yeah. I mean, he gets into this like, oh God, I haven't, you know, eaten, you know, cookies or whatever in, you know, a couple of days. And it's like, okay, what do you want a medal for that? I mean, yeah, right, it's right. not really going to make a difference. But I remember years ago when um, the South Beach, that South, was it South Beach Diet? South what Beach Diet, yeah. South Beach Diet came out and we were just starting to date at that time. And um, I went on it with a friend and I uh, said, so Tom, do you want to do it? And he says, no, I'm on the Long Beach diet. <laughs> he says, I just eat whatever I want. There you go. So, Let's move to so, Long Beach. So whenever he comes up with these cockamamie ideas like you, yeah. I, I just, I, I'm like. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show I, I, all I you people. I'm going to show all you doubters. Oh, you scoff. You go ahead. You scoff. And when I am doing the Culture Pop podcast with my shirt off, I will have the last <laughs> laugh. Oh my god! Okay, all right. I want to. I want to see that. Oh my god! Now you could have your shirt off, and then you'll crop it so it's only your hair. See, it's just to hear exactly. Um, so I wanted to actually. I was watching. Um, the, have you ever seen the show King Charles? It's Gal yes. King and Charles yeah. Barkley. Yes. And it's on like Tuesday nights on CNN. So Oprah was on it this week. Did you see it? I didn't, but I do like the show, actually. Okay. So Oprah came on and talked about how she has lost weight using Manjaro, which is one of those weight loss uh, drugs. 
And Charles Barkley immediately came out and said, Oprah, thank you for talking about this. I've also lost a lot of weight. I've lost 100 pounds using Manjaro. And right now, it is such a joke. Um, every, every comedian is doing jokes about Ozempic, right? Oh, they right. look great. Ozempic, you know, whatever, whatever that is. You know, I don't, I think we got to get rid of, and good for Oprah, she's the kind of person who would do it, and good for Barkley, kind of people that come out and talk about it and say, look, we, we battle our weight. Um, obesity is a disease. Um, we both struggle with it, and we used uh, Manjaro to lose it, and there's no shame in that. Now, do you have a judgment about people who use like Manjaro or Ozempic or any of those things? I, I I just don't think that it's a great idea. Because you know, why? I just health wise, I just don't know if it's a great idea. I don't even know what any of I I guess I'm not knowledgeable enough of like what's in it, you know. But you know, they come up with these pills and then they say, you know, you don't have to do anything. You just have to take a pill. You know. Wait, wait, though. This is real, Sue. This yeah. is real. I mean, I, I, I've seen Charles Barkley. He doesn't look like he lost 100 pounds. Oh, my God. He lost so much weight. When I saw him first uh, for the NBA season, I was like, oh, my yep. God, he's he lost all this weight. Right. Um, I've, I've got friends who have used it um, who have lost unbelievable amounts of weight. So, so is it is it an, an it's an appetite suppressant? I mean, have they correct? Is, it, are they under the care of a doctor? I mean, oh yeah, you're under the care of a doctor. A doctor has to prescribe this, but I I guess you give yourself an injection every week. Okay. You give yourself the injection, uh, and then it limits your appetite. It affects your appetite and your ability to get. I guess you can't eat, overeat anymore. Um, now, I don't see the downside to that. People shouldn't be overeating if this is the little trick they need to do it. And if people are losing a ton of weight, like there's one, I won't say his name, but there's a, a guy that uh, I see all the time downtown. And I'm telling you, he's lost 100 pounds. He looks fantastic. And, and, and I know he's on this. He's on this. Well, or I, this here's injection. the thing. Uh, we don't know. Oh. I assume. But everybody's afraid to own it. That's why I thought the Oprah thing and the Charles Barkley thing was a big deal. They were actually willing to come out and say, yeah, I lost a bunch of weight. I used, um, I almost called it Morongo, uh, the casino. Manjaro. I you used Manjaro. You, lo you lose your money at, at yeah, the casino. You lose weight and your money. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, but I think it's good that they're talking about it. And I don't think it should be a big joke or a, a moment of shame for anybody if that's the way they lose the weight and, and get healthier. Now, have there been um, uh, have there been cases with Ozempic where people like it's had an adverse effect? Uh, some people, I guess, I was reading about this. Some people have like stomach problems, or they get, uh, you know, they they uh, they don't tolerate it well. There are people, and then they just stop and they move on with their lives. But some people stay on it and may have to stay on it their whole life, and some people do it for a while and then stop doing it, and they may manage to maintain their weight. But I think it's generally a, a really good thing. And I thought it was really um, positive that uh, Oprah and Charles Barkley were willing to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, with this, we'll see what happens with it. You know, it's it's pretty new, right? Yeah, it's pretty new. It's pretty new. I don't know. You right. just follow the comedian's jokes and, you know, everybody makes the hacky Ozempic joke now. Well, because, you know, Oprah's weight has fluctuated so much over the years, you know? I mean, she, she looks got, great right now. She, yeah, she looks great. But there was a period there where she got, you know, really skinny and then then she ballooned up again. And, you know, um, it was it Al Roker. He actually looks pretty good. I mean, he Al Roker. Yeah. No, I don't think he was. I don't think he was as epic because he lost that weight a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what what he did, but um, yeah. Well, you know, we'll we'll see. I I look, you know, not everybody has the temperament and the the drive to to go to a gym, you know. Right. Um, right. But I but I think that you really still need to be active. I mean, that's 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 hard. That's that's hard stuff. Yeah. So, no, it is. You know, it is. You need you need to you know to take you know if you're not a runner, you need to take walks. You need to get your heart pumping uh, because that's that's really important, especially if you're overweight. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, last thing I wanted to get to, brand new show on Apple Plus called Palm Royale. It is the story of a woman named Maxine Simmons who is trying to get into the most exclusive club in Palm Beach, and it's set in the 1960s, so it's got beautiful production design. What What are you thinking of the show, Sue? Um, it's it's fun, you know. It uh, it's kind of like a it's got a quirk to it, like a like a Desperate Housewives in a way, you know. It's got a little the, of that with the relationships that that they have. Um, I I think that the cast is amazing. Ricky oh. Martin is insanely good. I've never he's also he's also a very good looking man, is he not? He's a very good looking man, and talk about being in shape. <laughs> I mean, I know. Even even my husband was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, he, uh, he looks great. Um, um, and Kristen Wiig, I she's underused generally, and I like I I don't see her all that often, and she is so entertaining and so funny. He's so funny, and just just every she you know she's she's so locked in. I mean, yeah. she oh, she goes the extra mile as an actor, you know. Yeah, and uh, whether it's like a. <laughs> You know, I mean, just a little aside or or and 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 the way she, you know, I wouldn't call it line readings, but the way she delivers a line is just it's so unique to who she is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. She's great. She's very well, I'm funny. two episodes in. It is on Apple Plus. Carol Burnett is so far just like, I don't know, is she in a coma? Something like that. Uh, yes. But eventually she's going to come to life. Um, and we've got a couple of guests coming up from uh, Palm Royale. Julia Duffy is going to join us. She plays one of the the women in the Queen Bee section. And then mm-hmm. Mindy Cohn. Mindy Cohn is going to join us great. on the show. She's, she's great. great. In it. Yeah, yeah, she's yeah. really good. Uh, so I want to remind everybody that if you are listening on Apple or on Spotify, take a minute and subscribe to the show. Leave us a rating and a review. Leave us a five-star rating and a positive review. That's what I meant to say. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, hit the like button right away and subscribe to the channel. We always have great stuff coming. You can scroll down, leave us a comment, a review, a snarky joke, whatever you got. All that stuff helps us to grow the show, and we really are making a big push this year. We got brand new studio stuff. We're uh, we've got uh, we're working on some new video editing stuff, like all kinds of stuff to uh, to to really build out the show, Sue. So I'm I'm excited about it. Uh, So here we go. Our guest today is best known for his starring role on The Mentalist, which ran for seven years on CBS. He was an Emmy and a Golden Globe nominee. His films include L.A. Confidential, Land of the Dead, The Devil Wears Prada, Breath, and High Ground. His latest film is the critically acclaimed Limbo, directed by Ivan Sen. Simon Baker joins us. Simon, thanks a lot for coming on, man. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Uh, so huge fan of Limbo, which is your uh, brand new movie that's coming out here in uh, Southern California and across the country. Um, your director is a fascinating guy. Um, his name is Ivan Sen. He is uh, a, of Aboriginal descent. Tell me about sort of working with him and this idea of outback noir. Yeah, Ivan. Um, you know, he went. He went to film school, the Australian. Um, film and television radio school which uh, at the time was quite a prestigious school very small number of students uh he was in the same class as another indigenous filmmaker that you probably know of warwick thornton right yeah yeah he, he did a film called sweet country uh samson and delilah um and he's just he's a very quiet uh restrained guy i would really um He's he's quite shy, but um, incredibly soulful, and just works very quietly. He's, his first film was a film called Beneath Clouds that won the Golden Bear at uh, Berlin, um, and that was some time ago. I met him back then, um, and he had a project, and I can't remember exactly what the project was, uh, but it never really got a got up and got going, and. And had since sort of reconnected with him, and 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 um, he sent me the script. Um, he, he does, as they say, uh, you know, he does the lot. He's like a multi hyphenate. He 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 writes the scripts. They're they're largely all. Most of his scripts are inspired by aspects of 
his family, um, his his family's experience, um, and uh, he so he works for a place of feel and, and heart, and he and he's also incredibly connected. All of his films are incredibly connected to location, to 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 place, um, and he, he sent me a script. I um I was first before I even opened the script. I was kind of really excited to work with him just as a director to because I'm a, I've I've been a director myself. Uh, I just like watching the way other directors work, and because he writes, he 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 writes, he directs, he shoots, he cuts. He does the score. He does the. He pretty much does the whole thing. I mean, we had a crew of about. I mean, at if you counted the producers, probably about fifteen people. So oh, wow, wow. So it's it's a very intimate experience, and um, I was just fascinated to watch how how he approaches things, and he he's he's probably he's possibly doing all elements of filmmaking from the from the beginning process of writing. Because he's thinking about um, how he can make it in a contained what way. He doesn't, uh, you know. I don't think he's ever really made a film that has a, a has a an expansive cast. They're all sort of, I mean, almost like parlor pieces. You know, like those. Uh, I like to refer. Well, Limbo particularly reminds me a little bit in in the way it was made. Uh, I, I researched them a bit a years ago. I, I like westerns. And um, the Bud Bodica Westerns um, with uh, Randolph Scott. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. They, they, they were parlor pieces. They were, you know, and the, and the location was, you know, there's only sort of ever four or five characters in the whole film. Um, but they were um, very simply constructed um, and the location was a big part of it. And I, and I feel a little bit like that's, that's sort of how this is approached. If you if I reference that to Ivan, he'd be like, oh, he doesn't really watch a lot of movies. He's he's got a very unique approach to it to to the way he works. Yeah, you know, the location be became kind of a character in of itself. Oh, you know, Matt, like probably the most important character for the piece is that location. And being that it was shot in black and white, was that always the intention? We're pretty early on, you know he. He he just jumps in his car and he, dro- he you know he he had driven out to Cuba PD um, before he I think before he did me I think he discovered sort of Cuba PD as, as the location to write a film and then he spent time out there and wrote the film uh, and whilst he's there he's photographs he generally photographs he almost makes the film with photographs first not like storyboards but he just photographs locations and faces. And he started to send me, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a photographer as well, so we shared that sort of language of communication. Um, uh, and he started sending me some photographs, and they were all monochromatic. Um, some of them, um, the girls in in the film, before they were even cast, just photographs of them because they were local kids. Um, <laughs> and... He sent me one of the emails. By the way, I think this could be one of the girls, and um, it was. And and the in the photograph, the clothes that she was wearing, she wore in the film. You know, mm. like that's how that's how there's a, there's a pureness to it. So there's it's it's not by no means is it documentary, but there's an authenticity to it that's that um, simple. None of the sets are dressed. The the the, the None of them. None of them are built. There's no builds. They're all practical locations. You know, he he would leave if there was a pile of sort of whatever over there in the church. He would just he just left it there. Um, the bedside lamps in my in the in the characters Travis's hotel room. Yes. Uh, he brought those. They were in the back of his car. Yeah. That's how he worked. He had the. By the way, in- a. A very charming hotel you were staying in. <laughs> <laughs> that, that looks like the creepiest place. It's like carved out of the side of, and you're going into a tunnel to get in. I mean, it, 
it looks like is it a real hotel yeah yeah no that's what i said it's all it's real yeah wow well it looked it looked like the, it looked like the kind of place where you would get your her- heroin like room service <laughs> no it's <laughs> you you know the the temperature in Kibbutz, people live in dugouts like that um and you the temperature is consistent all year round you know it's like it's a consistent sort of 23 degrees celsius so whatever that is probably like the high 60s late you know and you sleep the sleep of the dead when you're in there because it's you turn the light off and it's like okay you can't there's nothing it's black yeah, yeah. you know it's funny i was watching uh this last weekend a paulo sorrentino movie and he's got these great sort of sweeping the camera moves ivan is completely different it looks like a lot of times he's just he sees an image puts out the sticks, and then the sticks don't move. Is that pretty much the way it works? We use a dolly a bit, um, but yeah, by large, like he'll set a frame, um, and because he's from a a, a photographic background, he'll set a frame and we'll work around that frame. You know, there'll be a little, you know, he did this a couple of pans here and there. Um, But there's something... There's something about shooting that large format. He shot it um, large format. Uh, he wanted to shoot it. He wanted to shoot it uh, um, on the 65. You know the Alexa 65, but um, he had some problem with Thor had rented all the cameras. You know um, the Marvel. Oh yeah, they, they had yeah. taken all the cameras, <laughs> and he was like, he was he, he was he was promised a camera, and they palmed it off to Thor, but he, um, so he shot it large format and he, he originally he did want to shoot the thing on film and it just from Australia, the old, you had to send the, the, um, the, uh, rushes back to, uh, to the U S and, and then ship them back. And it was just cost prohibitive. So he shot it, he shot it digitally. I think he actually dropped in a couple of his, he's got a, he's got his own sort of cinema camera. I think anyway, he was out there, one of the troops, he shot some stuff and he dropped a couple of those shots into the film. Um, and they, I think they, you know, often people shoot um, stills, you shoot a bit of film, you shoot a bit of digital, you grade the digital to the film. So you've got that as a template, great. Um, but he dropped a couple of actually 35 mil shots in there. But there's something about the large format cameras and the focal lengths you could get you could get close, but it still didn't feel too close. You still saw enough of the landscape. Um, so that's what he just trusts. You know, he's he's a very confident director, but a very quietly confident director. He really believes in the frame and what's working in the frame. Um, you know, look, I think I think this feels up for everyone. There's a lot of people that would probably find it uh, quite slow, um, but it is so intentionally. Uh, because he's telling, uh, he's telling a bigger, uh, deeper, and and more important story than just the just the, the detective or you know um, cold case genre aspect of it. You know, you brought up an interesting uh, criticism that people sometimes have about a film that has that slower pace, and how could you do it any other way? You know, well, this particular what once you see it, you go, well, that had to be like that. That's the meditation of that film. You know, it's funny. Like it sometimes when I when I when I watch it, I watched it a few times, and obviously I, I was I was involved as a producer, so I I saw earlier cuts of it. Um, but there was a few times where I, where it reminded me a a little bit, and I and I mean this just sort of like aesthetically and the the. Uh, pacing at times of um, that Alfonso Cuarón film Rome, Roma. Oh yeah, mm. you know, like, like, um, but just very considered in in the cuts and in the framing. I mean, I think Alfonso Cuarón had a lot more dolly. We used dolly a little bit, but you know, we were we shot it in sixteen days, he, and, and, and Ivan was like, you know, that's the way he likes to work. He doesn't. 
he's he's beautiful like that where he doesn't like the idea of of um um waste on a film set like we're, we're here to make the film we're not we're not sort of here to you know be it sometimes I, i've worked on a lot of different films raging films and that's 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 a joy the joy of having worked for as long as i've worked is you experience all different types of movies but there's so often there's a lot of fat in filmmaking um and I think he gets really excited by how how lean and close boat it is, and that and, and and that really is reflected in all of his films, and I think it's definitely reflected in the rawness of this film. Uh, your character Travis is trying to figure out who killed an Aboriginal woman twenty years ago, and I'm sure I was trying to figure out as I was watching the movie, what's the relationship like between first Australians and white. Australians. Does it is it comparable to the relationship between African Americans and uh, white Americans in the U.S.? I mean, I think it depends on how you look at it. I think there's, um, yeah, I think sometimes at times possibly, um, but I think uh, uh, no, I think it's probably close to the relationship with with um, First Nations. Um, Americans, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, it's that it, the the uh, the Australian um, the First Nations Australians are are an ancient culture that have existed, you know, on that land and and so tightly connected to country, to place, um, you know, they've existed continuously for sixty thousand years. Um, and that culture still continues as much as uh, the colonization of Australia um, put end to certain um, aspects of it. And, and re- you know, there was, there was uh, multiple, um, well, was, you, you know, the colonization of any indigenous peoples is, is, is a genocide. And uh, that, well, there was it was it was it was brutal and it was ongoing and I and I feel um, in a lot of ways uh, answering the first part of that question is next to impossible because that's more of an individual thing. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, we had a we had a referendum um, last year to uh, a vote to a national vote to uh, enshrine in our constitution a voice. An indigenous voice to Parliament to um, uh, represent and reflect uh, issues that um, impacted uh, Indigenous Australians, and we and we and that did not pass resoundingly, which wow. was which was quite a which was quite confronting. But um, to to have a national vote and a referendum isn't as simple as "oh, just vote on this." There's a lot of um, political um, influence and tactics that go on around that. So campaigning and 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 <laughs> as you're very aware in this country, um, that's it suddenly gets muddied very quickly. And and tr- truth. Um, and messaging and speculation and fear all get thrown into the bag. And next thing, you, excuse me, next thing you know, it's 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 for some people, it's a far more complicated choice than the than the simple sort of oh yeah, of course. How is this going to impact me in my everyday? In no way, but how is this going to potentially impact uh, Indigenous Australians enormously, given how? Given how the brutality of the colonization of of, of Australia, uh, my country, um, has impacted Indigenous Australians through intergenerational trauma, and I think this film displays how intergenerational trauma uh, it exists and is a real thing, um, just in regards of how how. Uh, lack the justice system can be in 
relation to um, Indigenous women and children that disappear. And I think this is a global phenomenon. Yeah, um, it's it's certainly you know the film played in Toronto, and uh, a lot of the interviews and a lot of the conversations uh, that we were having in Toronto are around around the same topic. Um, it's it's a massive problem uh, in in countries where the First Nations people have been colonized. So do in- Indigenous people in Australia, they, they do not hold any kind of public office? They're, are they not in government at all? There, you know, there are individuals that are in government and there's, and there's, and there's depending on the government, what, 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 what we were trying to do in Australia was um, enshrine a voice in the constitution. So it was a constitution, the, the constitution was amended. So that there was always to be a voice uh, that advises Parliament on on matters that relate to Indigenous First Australians, right? First Australians. They had a voice. It was always going to be there. So if the current government um, had something in legislation and then, and then the opposition government got into power, they couldn't just mix it and start again because that's basically what was happening, you know? And so, so there was no consistency. Um, there, there was no sort of, um, there was nothing solid about, uh, something that could be relied upon because to, to deal with, to deal with, uh, aspects of intergenerational trauma, you need generations of support and strength, right? It's not going to yeah. happen yeah. in a, it's not going to happen in a four year term. That's just absurd, right? You need a couple of generations of support, and um, yeah, it was. I, I personally, you know, everyone everyone has their right to vote however they want, but I personally was quite, um, I was, I was quite uh, devastated that that didn't get passed. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So um, I want to. I'll circle back around to limbo, but I want to ask you about a couple other things um, over my shoulder. This shoulder uh, right. is a uh, poster for Chinatown. You were in what I would argue is the second best uh, film noir picture set in Los Angeles of all time. Uh, L.A. Confidential, an amazing cast. Uh, Curtis Hanson, the director. When you were making that movie, did you have a sense that you were making a, a classic film? That was my first film. Wow. So I was... Um, shaking in my boots let's just say that i was um pretty much beside myself that i was even there on that set um so no i had i had no idea uh i was just i was just thrilled i look look i love um i i love the genre and i love i loved um you know i, I loved uh, uh, um james ellery's book uh, and his writing, and he personally is such a character. So I, um, and I was a fan of a lot of the actors that were in the film. So I was sort of very excited by it, and I thought it was the period was fantastic. Uh, and to see Hollywood, I'd only just arrived. I mean, I yeah, it was the it was it was basically the first job that I did here. I arrived, I arrived in um, beginning of '96, I think it was. Or, and I think we shot in 96 and it came out, I think, in 97. Yeah. Special. Yeah. It's a great right. one. Sue actually went back and watched a movie that you directed called Breath. Mm-hmm. Um, and Sue, you you love this thing, right? I loved it. You know you know what it, it reminded me a little bit? It was one of my favorite movies from years ago was Summer of 42. Mm-hmm. It was just, just such a, it was it was poignant, and um, the relationship. I I really related to it because the relationship of those two boys were very uh, reminiscent to where I grew up in Long Island, New York. All the all the bad boys surfed, and they surfed from a very very young age. Same thing, waking up the crack of dawn on their stingray bicycles, holding awkwardly holding the surfboard. And um, and they were diehards. I mean, at, at at like twelve years old. I mean, it was it was unbelievable. So it was so authentic to me. Um, and the relationship 
that that um, Picklet is that his name? Pick Picklet. 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 Picklet had with his father juxtaposed to the relationship that he had with you, and the fact that 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 uh, this was adapted from a book. I wanted to ask you a, a question because I thought this was such a great juxtaposition. There was kind of like a competition thing in in a way with with the dad and you, you know, watching the father see his son who he didn't have seemingly such a close relationship with go off with you and 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 but and, and his father fished and there was a scene where he was in a boat with his dad. He decided to go with his father and spend time with him. So he's in this calm water with his dad fishing and I loved that when he was with you he was in the rough water with these, with you know, the ocean, you know, the danger of the ocean. Was was that in the book that his father uh, was a fisherman? Um, I'm trying to remember. Yes, I think it was, but you know, I I, I think um, I grew up like that. Like that's 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 why those those moments that you mentioned feel very authentic. But I. Um, I just really loved that idea of how, at a certain point, with a with a boy kind of becoming a man, and the way you you are under the wing of your father, and then you push further and further out, and you seek uh, to find your limitations uh, and and levels of sort of comfort, which is really at, at the core of a lot of what the film is about. Um, but that idea of, um, I'm a, I'm a father of two sons, <laughs> uh, and a daughter. Um, but, um, so, so a lot of that's very relevant of, of, of when you also, when your kids starting to become, your kids starting to become their own person and they're pushing away from you and the, and the beauty of that, but the pain of that as well. Um, and. And and the and and then the glorious moment where your kids choose to be with you, even though you know it's not as exciting for them as where they want to be. But yeah, I obviously it's a subtle film, but I wanted I want yeah I'm always looking with anywhere where there's a dynamic of drama um, or push and pull, you know, like some sort of a resistance. And I I could feel into the character of Pikelet. Because I sort of experienced that myself, but I could also feel into the character of his father. Um, because I experienced that as well. And these are all sort of natural, healthy ways of part aspects of growing up and 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 moving away. And then yes, there is that bit near the end where where he's having a cup of tea and he's watching his parents together and he's sort of beautifully accepting of their their humble, quiet existence. Yeah, and I and I love the relationship between the two the two boys, Looney. Um, you know, I he reminded me so much of one of the guys that I grew up with because he was so bad. You know, he was like this like Eddie Haskell kind of leave it to beaver kind of character. And yeah. and but he was so much fun. Um he was yeah. aimed for anything, but you always knew if you were with him, something really, really bad could happen. But yeah. he just gravitated towards him. So it was no surprise what what happened to him, you know, a little bit later on. We all know those characters. Oh God, absolutely. Yeah. There's yeah. even a line in uh, Limbo where I think uh, Travis says, "When you hang out with crazy, you're eventually going to deal with crazy." Yeah, yeah, crazy things will start to happen. Yes, yes. So you became a household name in the U.S. in The Mentalist, and I, I'm wondering if it if it's like fun for you to play a character like Travis, you, I mean, your shaved head and tattoos and gritty, drug addicted, all that stuff. Is it fun to shake off that uh, that role and do something completely different? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. You know, I, I think there was a lot of great aspects of, of, of being on a successful show like The Next List. There's, there's a lot of incredible positives. Um, but essentially, I, I'm I'm an actor, and I'm a I'm probably I'm probably more a character actor than than a, 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 I ever was a leading man. But you know, once 
you know, once you get sort of into a mold, often, particularly, I think in, in, in Hollywood, well, I think, I think all over the world, but once people see you and up people see you as a certain way, that's the, the expectation that's, that's what, that's what you do. Um, but, uh, and I did that, that character for so many years. I, uh, and, it, and it was in 130 countries around the world or something like that. It was, you know, it was quite pervasive. Um, I, uh, by the end of it, I could wait to do something else. So I went, you know, I left, I finished, we finished that show and, and I, and I went straight to Australia and I did, I made breath. Um, and you know, and then I just thought, you know, look, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to have to put myself on ice anyway. You know, I can't just come back unless I'm going to come back and do another TV show. And it's like, that's not, that's not in my plan creatively. Um, um, and maybe been in other people's plans, but uh, it's not, it wasn't really for me. Um, so I was motivated by the idea of wanting to just, just go back to the simple things of being an actor and playing different characters. And, um, I've made a couple of films, a few films in Australia, um, and then the characters have all varied and been a bit different. And uh, I, I just, I guess, I think I'm just sort of enjoying um, not having it just be one way. Like I, I look at every little job now that comes in. Um, I, I just, I'm on this thing on Netflix that's out now called Boy Swallows Universe. I mean that, and again, that's like a, that's like a seven hour. Australian story and it's um, hugely entertaining um, and quite potently beautiful. There's a lot of heart in it, but I get to play, you know, it's, it doesn't sit squarely on my shoulders, the responsibility of the whole piece, but I get to play a fantastic character that has a, has a real transformative arc and uh, it's fun. I, uh, I can relax and I can really throw myself into what it is that uh, gave me the inclination to want to do this for a job in the first place. So, which is very, uh, it's a very privileged position to be in this, in this industry. Uh, there's an element of risk involved. Like I probably could have gone back and just done, um, what was safe and what people would expect of me to do. But, uh, I saw this as a, as a great opportunity. And I did that job and, um, I did limbo, I did that job. I've done a couple of other things before with, in, in Australia, but like I said, it's not. You, you make films in Australia. You make you do work in Australia. Sometimes that's all the only place that it stays, and we don't have a large audience, so we don't have great budgets. And I think the way film and television industry is now globally, there's far more opportunity for stories to travel across borders um, and to be seen. Uh, largely like a window into another uh, society or culture. Um, so uh, it's great. It's a great time. I, and I'm able to live there. Uh, I'm in the moment I'm working. I just did a, 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 a limited series with Justin Kurzel, is another straight, very good Australian director based on a, on a, um, on a respected piece of literature called narrow road to the deep north and uh i think um, jacob and lord is the, the the protagonist the main character in that and that was a wonderful experience and it's a very australian story that i think will get around the world thanks to you know probably the the, the global admiration for jacob lordy yeah he's uh, he's got he's become a, a big deal yeah he's a lovely guy um and and i think he's a good actor and and I'm now now I you know now I I got a call from Taika Waititi and I've I've been over in New Zealand working on his latest film um, Clara and the Sun. It's the um, on based on the uh, Ishi, Ishiguro book, um, and that's again another sort of experience. So you, you know f films are made all over the place, and you know we got people from all over the world in films so it's it's a good time it's just nice this is nice for me to sit down and and that you recognize the film that i made you know five years ago um that's uh I, I feel i feel honored to be able to sit and talk about that and I, and I feel i feel very honored to be able to take this little 
Australian film that we made in 16 days that is a, is a really potent movie about really important issues that uh, are impacting people all around the world and to and to put that onto a screen um, in a purely cinematic way and let that story unfold and let that story reach and touch people uh, it's a, it's a it's a really great privilege and um, it's not I'm, I'm screening it tonight at, at Lemley's and doing a Q and A, um, and I, I really look forward to to doing that. And I think you have to do that with small films. You've actually got to deliver them to an audience. You've got to hand them over because we don't have, you know, we can't, you can't. There's only a few, a handful of films made each year, and it's pretty obvious which ones you that you, you can sort of slap a sticker on a McDonald's. Uh, um, shake for the film <laughs> or, you know, it's on the side of buses, you know. Yeah, there's everywhere. no limbo happy meal out there. There's nothing, you know, we don't, we, the expression <laughs> in Australia we use is that we don't have a pot to piss in, you know. Like, yes, it's, yes. It, yeah. All the money yep. goes into making the film and, and there's a lot of love in those films and it's, and it's really beautiful when an audience shows up to experience the love that's on that screen yeah well it's a uh, it's a terrific movie we were both really excited to see it it's cool gritty looks unbelievable great story about injustice and uh the uh, the first australians and and their treatment over the years i strongly recommend it uh directed by ivan sen a guy who i will absolute whatever his next thing is i will absolutely uh seek it out and whatever you do next all the stuff that you've talked about we will be watching, Simon. Thank you so much for coming on, and we, we appreciate you a lot. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate this chat. Take care. There you have it. There's Simon Baker, who, by the way, in uh, Limbo, you think of him a certain way because of the mentalist. He's virtually unrecognizable in, in Limbo. Shaved head and tattoos, and you would never know that that was the mentalist. He looked like Brian Cranston in Breaking Bad. 100%. He did. He it did. was unbelievable. Um, God, it was such a departure from what I've seen him in. You know, he's kind of always this like really handsome guy with long hair and, uh, you know, beautiful smile. And and he was I, I, I love that he did that. I love that he that he took a role that was so removed from what you know him to be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's an unbelievable movie to look at. The, the black and white and the vistas and this almost like lunar kind of surface uh, with, and they had some great drone shots over every, it's, it's a great movie and creepiest hotel and creepiest church I've ever seen. Oh the church was super creepy. Well, just being in a room that is uh, carved with, out of no, stone, stone and there's no windows, um, you know, there there was something that that Tom showed me. Um, if it's a hotel that's in like a cave, and you drop down like on a rope to get to it, and um, really, yeah, I, I have to find out where it is. And I was like, there's no way in the world that I could ever do anything like that because I am so claustrophobic. But just being someplace where there's no windows, yes, I. I worked. I worked in an uh, in a uh, at Sunset Gower Studios. I worked on a show where our offices were in the basement, and there were no windows, and it was low ceilings. It was kind of like being in a submarine, and it was horrific. I mean, I it, it was so difficult to work, and I'm sitting in an office with three other people. It's crammed. There's nowhere to look. It's just wall. Um, yeah, it was horrible. So, yeah. oh boy. When you when you see this movie, you'll understand exactly what Sue's talking about because they it's it's by far the creepiest, weirdest hotel because you're basically sleeping in a cave, and it's real. It's an yeah. actual place, which is amazing. All right, there you have it. There is your Culture Pop podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching and watching. Uh, don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and on our YouTube channel. Uh, we appreciate you being out there all the time, and we will see you next time on the Culture Pop Podcast. Mm -hmm.